As a woodworker, do you know where your material comes from? You know the smart aleck answer would be, hey, comes from a tree. But saying that, isn't that kind of like saying a barbecue chef says, hey, my stuff comes from a cow or a pig. I mean, those guys, they get the prime cuts at a specific spot just for a specific application. Shouldn't us woodworkers do the same thing? Or at least know where the wood's coming from from the tree so we can anticipate things like movement, how it's going to dry, its strength, its purpose for a specific application. That's what we're going to discuss today. We're going to butcher a tree like a pig. So we have our classic tree. So, all, right off the get-go, let's say this. If you are an industrial lumber maker, a lumberjack, milling places, stuff like that, there's only a certain portion of the tree that you're concerned with. And that's basically about a foot or two above the ground, up into a foot or two below wherever the first branch is. And that might be way up high, but if you have a branch that fell off, you've got to bring that down. That is the area that's going to return the straight grain that your millwright people, your furniture making people, all those guys pretty much demand. Everything else is either too small or too much reaction wood or too rotted or there's so many other variables. So in a big tree, it's really only the trunk that's of commercial value to the majority of the world for what we're using wood to make stuff with. At least solid wood, that is. And that's only if it's the right tree. Now, a tree's main purpose is to gather water and gather sunlight. Which is why, even though Texas has a lot of grasslands and deserts, I mean, we have some of the biggest trees you have ever seen in your life. But, they tend to grow out in these big fields, these giant oaks where, you know, you, you could drive your car around the outside. I mean, you can't even see around the huge. There's no way a dozen people could reach around them. They're just massive with lots of lots of mass. And they're completely worthless to furniture makers because there's no competition for sunlight. They basically, their trunks don't grow very high, but their canopies grow out really really wide sometimes several hundred feet wide and they stay just high enough so that the deers and the cows can't reach up and eat the little budlings so you look at that well this a foot above the ground a few feet above the ground and then up you know a few feet below that first branch there's just not that much good wood there which is why lumber is called more of a forestry industry. Because they prefer forests. And I don't know if it's a chicken or an egg. Why do we prefer cherries, maples, uh, specific oaks, uh, apples, that kind of stuff? Could it be that how they grew was nice and straight and stuff like that? So those were the trees we originally started harvesting. So we developed tools that just worked well with those trees. Maybe if uh, we didn't have this option, those wide oaks in Texas would have been the, our preferred materials because we would develop the tools for those. Instead, you know, in Texas we made grass huts, or the desert they made mud huts. Whereas in the forest, they got access to these really tall, straight trees where they were competing for sunlight. So the canopies tended to grow up instead of out and wide. And they had to reach for the sky. Which could also be why walnut has its own unique classification for how uh, they grade the lumber. Because walnut trees aren't a very hardy tree. If they're trying to compete in, in a tight forest, they're not going to survive. So especially down in Texas, walnuts are generally kind of a river bottom tree. They grow along lakes and, and rivers and stuff like that. Which means that they tend to have deep tap roots because they are seeking for the water. They're a water-thirsty tree. And the roots go really deep to anchor them pretty well, but they suck up a lot of water, and it allows them to grow over 
the riverbeds. They can grow sideways and stuff like that. Which, because the grain isn't going straight, it's actually hanging off the side and there's a lot of torsion in there. It creates what they call reaction wood. And we as woodworkers hate that stuff. A tree branch is the best example of reaction wood that I can think of. If you think about it, a tree branch is having to hold up a lot of weight. And the bigger the branch gets, the more weight it is. So what happens is the pith of the branch, you know, it'll start out towards the center. And then as it goes out along the branch, it's going to get higher and higher and higher until it's really close to the top. The reason why is the branch is trying to uppercut to lift the weight. So all of its growth is happening underneath. And it, because of that, it adds pressure towards the top to lift that branch up to keep it from sagging so much. The problem is, if you want to use that piece of wood for something like making a chair leg or something like that, you will end up planing or cutting a little bit off the top and it will release that pressure and all of a sudden it's going to spring. And then you cut a little bit off the bottom, it's going to release some pressure there, it's going to go spring and it just bounces back and forth and you can never get those woods flat. Plus the fact that it's going to be a lot softer on bottom because it grew faster there. The growth rings are wider. You have a lot more early growth compared to late growth where the top of the branch is pretty much all late growth. Just rock hard. Which if you think about it, that walnut trees that are growing off the creek beds, well all of that's reaction wood. So you just can't use a lot of it. So when they start harvesting it, they have to get specific trees and then they have to cut it a certain way so that the reaction wood will make it, you know, cut but not twist. I mean, there's so many variables there that they can never get nice straight grains like you would in a cherry tree or a maple tree. So now we go back to our pristine tree, nice and tall. And we know that those industrial guys are going to come down below that first branch or that first crotch because they don't want to deal with that reaction wood. They want a nice consistent look to it. So why do they come up from the ground so far? Well, it's a lot of it has to do with that transition. Remember, if the tree is swaying in the wind, well, this has to develop a lot of strength down here. It has to develop some of that reaction wood, which is why if you, a lot of wood turners, or I mean, some wood turners will specialize in turning the center section right down here because it's almost like a burl. The wood's so twisted and react, it's really, really pretty. But you also have to understand that tr the tree has grown around things like rocks and pebbles and there's a lot of inclusions in that area as the tree just grows out. Also, from a commercial aspect of it, you have to understand that most trees have some kind of tap root that's going to go down to the water level in order to suck up as much water as it possibly can. And because this area is so wet and also it holds the most amount of sugar in a tree, because remember, whenever the uh, winter comes along, all that stuff comes down and hovers around here. Most of the time, the heartwood up the trunk doesn't have much sugar in it. It's pretty much theoretically dead. It's not doing too much. It's the sapwood and the cambium layers on the outside of the tree underneath the bark that's doing all the work. But for storage area, the root system, this center section right here, it stores a lot of the sugar and sometimes that sugar just doesn't make it back up to the canopy. And because the root system doesn't have bark, it doesn't have the skin layer, it doesn't have the protection layer, well all of a sudden you have an area of the tree that's not protected, it's got a lot of moisture and a lot of sugar. What do you think eats it? Bugs. A lot of times that's why it, the trees start to rot from the center right here because the bugs start eating it and then the moisture starts rotting and it's just kind of a combination and then you end up with a tree that's hollow. So if you're in the commercial business, why even take the risk? Because you're going to have little bug worms and lots of damage over there, plus the flares. I mean, there's lots of variables of why skip that bottom area of the tree. But is there anything about this part of the tree that us craftsmen could use? I mean, if the industrial people are just leaving it for scrap or waste or just going to grind it down, hey, maybe we can grab hold of it and use it for something. Oh, yeah. 
And throughout history, people have been doing that one. In fact, if any of y'all are green woodworkers, froze, the things you batter on the, uh, the excuse me, the mounts you batter froze with, what do they call that? I'm getting brain drain. Well, some of the best ones come from tree roots. You find a hickory tree. So you can put the handle, carve off the handle right there, and then you get that big tap root section. That thing is so hard, you can beat on it like just your life depended upon it to save you, and it's just going to last for years. I mean, that's what they used to do. They just go cut off the hickory tree to make spoons or something like that, then chop off the outside of the bark, and what was left was the perfect mallet. Well, how about coming back to that branch wood that, you know, furniture makers hate? Well, us wood turners or green woodworkers, they actually love that kind of stuff. Yes, it might twist and bend and stuff as it dries, but we'll go back after it's finished off and do a final turning. And, you know, if a bowl warps, who really cares? It's still going to hold your cereal. And, plus the fact, on a smaller branch, you can get more of a bowl. In bowl turning, the idea has always been you have the trunk, you have the center of the tree, you cut out the pith, because that's worthless, and then you can make bowls on either side. Well, if you just cut off the pith of the top of a branch, boy, that gives you nice figured wood. All of a sudden, you can start making hollow forms, vases, that kind of stuff, because you got a deeper section. Even though it, the branch was smaller than the trunk, we have a little bit more usable material, sometimes. Then you have woodworkers that actually depend upon that reaction wood, that branch, that strength, that constant grain going from one plane to another. I mean, boat builders, uh, what's that piece of wood that goes down the bottom of the boat, the Viking ships? You know, they always like that to be a solid piece of wood because it just added strength. Well, where do you think they got that bore? Well, it comes up here and then the branch breaks off. All that's circling up there, so all that top section is going to go, and you have your keel coming from, down from a boat. So they would actually seek out trees that might have one very large branch breaking off so that the boat would be stronger and easier to make. Trainware workers, they actually prefer branch wood. They want that bending action so that they can get a piece of grain moving all the way through their piece. A spoon carver, for example, making a ladle. You know, you want the handle coming out, then you want that little scoop. Well, what do you have? If the pith of the tree is breaking off here and running up, if you can split that so you get nice straight grain right there, and it runs through a thin handle to create your ladle. The perfect ladle is hiding in that branch. You just take advantage of the, the bending of the fibers to make, do most of the work for you. And speaking of reaction wood for spoons, one of the harder things to do is carving out that little bowl of a spoon or a ladle. Well, if you know that the wood is a reaction wood and as you remove the material, it's going to bend up, well, you have to carve away less in order to get your final shape as it dries. So it's a lot easier to do big pieces a little bit flatter with something like an axe that makes, removes a lot of wood and then cleaning it up, letting it warp to the shape you want and going on from there, than it would be to take use your little knife and scoop out that bowl repeatedly. I mean, kind of like getting the best piece of bacon from a specific part of a, a pig. You want to get the best material to make your job easier and give you a stronger, better whatever you're making by picking and choosing where you get your material from the tree. And yeah, a lot of people say, hey, well, you're just going to turn the canopy of a tree into firewood anyways. Well, yeah, if you have a thin branch, you can burn the whole thing. But most people aren't going to put a big, huge branch in the fire pit. They'll want to split it. And reaction wood does not split well. People that are splitting logs, they prefer the stuff, same stuff we do because it splits straight and it splits easy. That's why we gravitated to that straight grain stuff in the first place to begin with. First place to begin with. Yeah, same thing. 
But just because there's a lot of reaction wood doesn't mean that there isn't any commercial application for it. There are actually companies that specialize in going after the weird stuff. I mean, if you think about it, you got two giant branches coming off, splitting off just right. But there are their companies that will look at that tree and say, we want that specific one. You can take that foot above the ground to three or four feet up below the branch or probably six or seven feet below that branch because they're going to want part of that too. So let's just remove that portion of the section. We'll turn this to wood turners or something like that. But if you understand the physics of a tree, a tree is a lot like our human body. If you have two bones jutting off on different angles, well, we grow ligaments to hold those together so that our body doesn't split apart. A tree does a very similar thing in that it will grow ligaments holding these two sides together. Really dense, really packed in. And us woodworkers prize that kind of stuff. That's the crotch of the tree, the flame of the tree. A lot of people will seek out just that one section to put in the pan floating panels inside doors and stuff like that because it looks very, very pretty. And that is not a stressed member of a door, so it could be moved around. You can you float it for a reason. Well, there are a lot of commercial companies that will section off a tree just to capture that flame. So let me show you how they do that one. Just picture this tree turned sideways going this way. So we now have one branch going off this way and another branch going off that way. And the flame of the tree is just in the middle holding those two together. And I know a lot of wood turners that kind of kick themselves because whenever they're processing a tree, they have in that mentality, you got to get rid of the pit. So what do they do? They cut off this section, then this section, then they turn their bowls on either side. And guess what's missing in that bowl? The flame. So what you actually have to do when you're processing it for a really cool looking bowl is just assume that you're going to make one bowl that's boring, split the tree here, and then turn this bowl so that the flame is captured in, into it. Which is what a lot of commercial people do who make veneer. They will actually process the tree this way so that they can take thin slices and out of one tree maybe get a hundred crotch panels that they can put, then put on the MDF and put into floating panels or make nice tabletops or something like that. And the big fad right now with uh, uh, doing slabs is getting that one section right there where you get it breaking off. Oh, it's just gorgeous coming down the center of the tree. But the problem is you get somebody inexperienced that are cutting a slab and they will cut it this way. So you have a branch coming off this way, a branch coming off that way. And they're trying to get that slab right there. Well, if you cut it down the center, there's actually not much there. You need to cut it along its side to get it. Because that is a very thin spot in the middle of the tree suspended between those two, two areas. So, how you butcher that cow results in what the marbling is going to be in your steak. So hopefully dissecting the tree might explain to you a little bit what's going on when you're building a piece of furniture. Maybe you go into the lumber yard and you get a 12 foot long board and you notice that it is dead straight until maybe the last three or four feet and then the grain kind of goes off one way or the other. Well, you can pretty much understand that maybe when they milled that up, that got close to a branch and that little end section might not be the part you want to use for making a, a straight chair leg or something like that because it will tend to warp over time. Then again, you might just set that aside for a little while and let it dry, let it reaction, and use that in a part of your woodworking like the little brace on a chair where you want that natural curve to be there. So understanding where your wood came from within the tree, how it was butchered out of that tree, will affect a lot of your work. And as a craftsman, understand that you can use a lot more of the tree than what is presented in your local lumber mill. 
So if a tree comes down in your neighborhood, don't go be afraid of just going over and grabbing a few branches and trying your hand at spoon carving, understanding what part of the tree you want to get for that. And if you look at a lot of my turning videos, I will use a lot of branch wood because I like the fact that how the mushrooms or the hollow form or those kind of things will warp over time. It gives it a really good, a unique look and you just have to anticipate that based upon the grain direction and the reaction that you know is going to happen as you remove material. So don't be afraid of those flank steak off cuts because a good chef can make a really tasty meal out of them. So for today's bonus, I'd like to talk about Shannon Rogers again. If you remember, probably 50 episodes ago, I introduced you to him to the Renaissance Woodworker, his YouTube channel, as a great resource to learn uh, hand tool woodworking, which is what he specializes in. But he's also in the lumber industry, so he's a great resource for bouncing off materials about our materials. And he allowed me to, a few minutes of his time right before I did this video to bounce my ideas off of him about this analogy. And he told me a few things, you know, about the veneering that I didn't really kind of realize, but it made a lot of sense. And I passed that along to you. And he let loose a little nugget of information. His next uh, semester in his hand tool school is going to be all about green woodworking. A lot of the stuff we were talking about here. So I want to give you a heads up. Keep an eye out on the Hand Tool Woodworking School. He'll probably have some information very shortly, but he's about to announce a new semester, which if you've seen it, it his stuff is really in-depth and you'll get a lot of benefit out of it, that's going to specialize on green woodworking. I'll put a link down below.